I'd like to ask you to continue. As we designated just previously, we will go to the rest of the story now, which I think is rather a, an amazing part of my story. And that is, as I was mentioning, that our son had invited me to go to Europe with him. And the first day that we got back to Frankfurt, we did a tour up to Oberussel and then down to School Crippen. And in School Crippen, we decided we would stop for lunch. So we stopped at a Brahas, had a beer, and ordered a sandwich. And fortunately, the waitress could speak a little bit of English. We can speak no German. And uh, we had ordered our sandwich, and the, the proprietor had shown us how to make beer in his fancy beer making operation. He had a group of people there that he was training at the same time that we were visiting. So he made a detour for us to go through the brewery and watch him. He explained it to us in German, which I understand understood the the volumes and the so ons as far as the chemical aspects were concerned because I have had a little background in there. And ultimately we go to sit down and drink some of the fresh made beer as well as have a piece of uh, sandwich and wasn't but a little bit till the waitress asked us if she minded if we minded for her to call the local historian which they had recently hired we said no be delighted to entertain her also and inter be interviewed by her so she comes over with her husband and we sit there and discuss some of the happenings and ultimately she says would you mind if we bring the newspaper reporter over well the newspaper reporter turns out to be the newspaper owner reporter typesetter deliveryman uh, you name it he was it and he had brought his son with him whom we enjoyed visiting with and they invited us to go look around the, the neighborhood and they showed us where the jail from the previous years had been incorporated into the newest bank in town and I have pictures of the section of the jail that was incorporated in the in the bank so that put me a little closer to where I believed I was in the right place and uh, then he invited the newspaper man invited us to come back the next day to go to a museum that that his uh, friends had collected a bunch of paraphernalia that had come from digging out of the ground and mm -hmm. collections of all kinds of aircraft instrumentation etc <clears throat> so we came back out Sunday and looked at that then we had something to do on Monday so when we got back into the hotel Monday night we had a my son had a email from the son of the newspaper man saying that someone had contacted him during the day asking to to have me come back out that he wanted to meet me this was someone who had seen the article in the paper that had been published on Monday morning well they had taken pictures of us and had posted the pictures in the paper so he brought me a copy of that newspaper plus a newspaper from March the 10th of 1944 
They had collections of every newspaper printed since 1907. So, anyway, <clears throat> here I am in Frankfurt, supposed to be on my way to Brussels, and, I, and Chip had to be in Brussels the next day. I said, well, I don't have to be there until Friday when we leave to go back home. Well, my wife and his wife had put down strict edicts that I was not to be left alone anywhere in Germany. So uh, we said, well, what they don't know won't hurt them right now. So we lined up the, the uh, train fare out to school tripping, and just coincidentally the end of the train line stopped directly across the street from the newspaper office. So I had no problems there. I just took the train to the end and got off and walked across the street. And once I got there, then the, the boy put me in his smart car, which I see that Mercedes is planning on bringing smart cars to the States now. And true, only two people can be in there. and. If your luggage is very small, you can carry it with you. Otherwise, you have to hire another van or a trailer. But I get to the village, go across to the newspaper office. He comes out. We get in the car. He takes me about two or three minutes away from the office to a home that is upstairs in a condo affair and this lady meets us and she has a nice table set for a kind of a uh, cookies and coffee and so forth. Well, I'd been there maybe five minutes and the doorbell rang and here comes this man and woman upstairs and he comes in and he says, my name is Joseph Shiro in German, of course. And I said, well, we have at least one thing in common. My name is Joe Stilwell. We both are Joes. It turns, it turns out that he had been nine years of age when I was shot down in his village. I was the first American he had ever seen he told me things that were not in the newspaper. So I knew he was for real. He said, I remember our teacher encouraged us to go in the jail to see you and your partner and look at your equipment. Well, he was most fascinated with my electrically heated suit. He says it was light blue. And, I mean, he described it yeah. perfectly. And he says, I was most thrilled with that. And he's, then he went on to say that he remembered that the next day that the German truck came and it had some men in the front and he had two guards on the back of the truck with rifles. They got out of the truck, they got us into the truck, then they got back into the truck and they drove off. That was not mentioned in anything that I had said to the newspaper man nor any of the others that had interviewed me. So I knew he was yeah. he was what he was gonna, telling he was yeah. telling it as it happened. And I had plum forgotten about leaving with uh, in that truck, but. We went out to the field. He showed us right exactly where the where we, where I landed, which field I landed in. And he said, showed me uh, basically, uh, generally speaking, where the other fellow had landed in the trees. The trees were gone, of course, being sixty years yeah. later. Yeah. But he says that 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 area over there is where where those trees were, oh, and. It was 
unreal. You, you know, get, I mean, get goosebumps. Yeah. <laughs> There's no, I mean, when when you stop and think about your emotions in times like that, there's, there's just no way that the human body can can fathom mm -hmm. this type of re response that you're going to have. I mean, no way did I anticipate meeting anyone that could possibly have remembered that much of the situation. And apparently we were the only airplane that was even anywhere remotely around this place, even though it was at the most 15 miles from downtown Frankfurt. I mean, it's... That's an amazing story. It, it, it blows your mind yeah. when, when you stop and think about, what are the odds? Yeah. He had left home I imagine at 22, 23, gone somewhere else, built a business, had been in the in, in the construction business, industrial construction business, retired, and had come back home two or three years ago Golly. before I had gotten over there. Now, had I gone back earlier, Never. I would there yeah. would have been no connection. Had the guy from the newspaper and I put the article in the paper, when he did, we would have never met. Yeah. I mean, odds, and, you know, you flip your coin and you take yeah. your choices. Boy. I mean, it's, uh, it winds a, a, the rest of the story down to, to well, why even go through the other part of it? Yeah, <laughs> it comes full circle. It? it really does. It's, it was such a, an outstanding climax to yeah. what little bit of history I was involved with. Gosh. Because who would have ever guessed that you could run into somebody who literally saw yeah. you yeah. in probably one of the most horrendous yeah. experiences that you'd ever had before or since. And I bet that meant a lot to him, too. Sure it did. I'm sure, sure it did. Now I want to go back. Good. Good. I don't know but when Good. I get a chance, but it'd be interesting to go back and visit with him. It and, would, when you got more time. And, and just um, sit around and, and yeah. talk. Through, even through an interpreters, you, you could gather an awful lot about, you know, I don't know what what kind of experiences he had afterwards, yeah. how the war affected his yeah. life afterwards, which I'm sure would be fascinating to, to know. Yeah. When you were over in Europe during the war, mm -hmm. when you are in the service, did you realize that you were part of one of the most significant events in no. world history? Really? No, no. I was too young. And that is the reason that all youth are the first to be called on. You aren't afraid of anything. You don't mind taking chances. Your, your whole life is today. You don't concern yourself with what's going to happen tomorrow. All you want to do is get in the action right now. And there's an awful lot of people that do not understand that. Yeah, that's true. I mean, when you stop and look at where the armies of all times have come, they aren't the old men. Yeah, yeah the old men are the generals. But the one, the blood and guts are out there in, in yeah. the 18, 19, 20s. The youth. That's right. Well, Mr. Stillwell, you've got a fascinating story and you've led a fascinating life. Is there anything else you would like to say before we end our discussion? No, I just, I guess the main thing is as we 
together it acknowledged early on is I just wish that our government could see fit to deal with the veterans of the wars yeah. in some more amicable fashion yeah. well, instead of the, the, the hassle of uh, having to fight for every little yeah. inkling. Yeah, it's, it's not not a pleasant situation yeah. and, and uh, understand that we all can't be made millionaires, but uh, it would be nice if uh, there were a few bucks here and there that could be spread around yeah. to those who have served. And well, I just want to tell you how much we appreciate what you did for the country. You're, you're a hero. You went over there and fought the war and sacrificed a lot in a short period of time, and I just want to thank you on behalf of everybody for what you did for the country. Thank you, sir.
I, I wouldn't drink it as long as I came back with with my arm, arms and feet and uh, not seriously wounded. I was very happy. You know, uh, so many, well, the people who I interview, uh, it's interesting that it's probably the first time they really discussed their military experiences in some detail. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wondered about this, and I think the problem is that if you haven't been there and done that combat thing, mm -hmm. you're talking gibberish to the average civilian. Yeah. Well, oh, yeah. they're interested in the things like uh, we're just talking about. You, when you talk to civilians about it, they're yeah. more interested in things like, like uh, uh, the Turks going in the wrong direction, things like that. Well, but, uh, you know, crazy things happen during wars. They sure do. And uh, they want to talk about that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. People go out and do the job and yeah. win. Tell them about when you quit, when you started smoking again, when they told you to go up the hill and get to the bank. <laughs> that was in Korea. That was in Korea, yeah. But I, that was not, that was a number of years later. The Korean War. Was it a story about the smoking experience? Was it smoke cigarettes, cigars, pipes? No, it, it was he, the, uh, this, the, General ordered him to take his troops up the hill and get the tanks. Yeah, well, they'd captured the, Ger the Germans had captured. Uh, no, but you weren't fighting. Well, this who was? Korean War. Korean War. This was Korean War. The Chinese had captured. I get my wars mixed up. <laughs> but the Co so many. Korean War and the Germans. The Chinese. the Chinese and the Koreans. Uh, North Koreans. North Korean, yeah. Oh, we had a, we had our main forces that had been stopped. They were already engaged with with the uh, Koreans, and so uh, we went up. A period that was very threatening to our troops, and so we halted until we could get the troops together. And uh, while we were, uh, I was a regimental commander then, and the, the general came up and told me, he said, we got to get those Germans, uh, the Koreans, out of that place, position they're in, and you, your, your regiment's got to do it. And uh, I looked over there, <laughs> this Germans had dug in. And uh, I had known, I knew what, what the Germans had in the way of armament. And I knew that we were going to lose a lot of men if we took off uh, against uh, the uh, Koreans. So uh, I, I said, yes, sir. And then I'd, I'd quit smoking. I'd, up to that point, I'd quit smoking. And then I thought about it, and I turned around and just walked away and came back to the general and said, General, have you got a cigarette? <laughs> so I'm just smoking again till the end of the war. <laughs> I got to be a three-pack a day my man myself over that career. Yeah. Got flying B-26 bombers. Yeah. Up and down those valleys and along the... Well, I know. That's something that I used to see you flying over it. <laughs> My uh, grandson wanted to know what I did. I said, I flew tadpoles. <laughs> he said, you flew tadpoles? What are you talking about? It was a tactical land direction party, TADP, mm -hmm. so we just decided to call them tadpoles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you know what? Our accuracy was the, the tactical land direction was in a van on the ground, and they would tell us what to do, you know, set course and in a barometer setting, all the things mm -hmm. you do to set up for a bomb run. And so help me, we would drop the bombs better than when we went out and tried to do it ourselves. So mm -hmm. <laughs> that pole was a pretty effective way to yeah. bomb. Mm -hmm. You're not risking human lives. That's right. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, uh, 
When I reflect on the Korean War, it seems to me that uh, when I was there, I was there when the war was over. Uh, we had uh, recall reserve officers for the largest, for the air crews mostly. And they were pretty upset that they had had their civilian careers uh, interrupted again. Mm -hmm. But the thing that really upset them was the national policy was not to let us win the war. Yeah. Exactly. And we still have our troops in Korea. They mm -hmm. said resolve that matter. Yep. And uh, I reflect that uh, Vietnam was not the only place we had some idiots in control mm -hmm. on a political level. Yeah. And I better stop there because I'll be talking about some people who become icons. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I remember that. Yeah. I remember. I was Truman was the most unpopular president ever when he left office. You know. Mm -hmm. Now he's got to be a, a hero again, mm -hmm. thanks to Margaret and some of the yeah. folks in McCullough. Yeah. And I guess he's a tolerably good president. I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, he did not compare, in my opinion, favorably with General Eisenhower. No. Of all the presidents we've had since World War II, I think was probably far and away the most mm -hmm. competent. Well, he did a good job. Did a marvelous job. Yeah. Marvelous man. And he had a political problem on his hands, too, with our allies. He could finesse those politicians. Yeah. <laughs> He's a master at that. Yeah. yeah. Well, they respected him, how our allies did. That's right. Mm -hmm. So the Korean War is over and you're back in the States again? Yeah, back in the States. I noticed that you have about every decoration a man can get. Uh, you must have been around the Pentagon at one time or another. I was. I was there three times. But, uh, well, that represents two wars, you know. Well, yeah. yeah that represents two wars. World War II and the Korea, infantry. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I managed to get in three. Uh, uh, you, you retired before Vietnam, I take it. Yeah, I did. That was another disaster. Yeah. I couldn't believe what I was seeing over there. Mm -hmm. Well, I, they still talk about it in the Army, Vietnam. But I didn't get involved in Vietnam. Well, we're, wondering, we're running about, we got about 16 more minutes to go. Uh, what uh, what would you say is your most uh, interesting or noteworthy memory of your military career? Well, I let me think I haven't, haven't compared experiences with within the wars, but I, One of the most interesting ones was when the when the Germans surrendered to us up on the uh, I think it was up south of of uh, the End River, and uh, when they came when they. For a week beforehand, they were shooting at us, and what we we had we had word not to advance any further. But they were either shooting, dropping artillery on us every now and then, but not too much. But uh, then the war ended. And just before it ended, they got word to uh, come off. The German, the uh, Russians were pursuing, start, had, had run the uh, uh, Germans out of uh, Vienna, and uh, they were headed in our direction, and it didn't stop. They came right on over. We had a bridge in there, and they came right on our bridge, and some of them forded the river, and uh, and uh, they. Uh, Oh, they didn't have anything. They didn't even have white flags. They came just came across, and uh, we put in a ponton bridge, and they came across that bridge. But many of them forded the river. It was fordable there, and uh, I thought that was a memorable occasion because it was an enemy that we'd been trying to destroy and lay us, 
and all of a sudden we were letting them come into our lines, and then when they got there, we fed them. <laughs> the war was over, they didn't have any food, we fed them. They wanted to get away from the Russians. They wanted to get away the Russians from, from the Russians, there's no doubt about that. The Russians weren't easy on them, and Russians were some cause. Good cause, because uh, if you read the account of uh, the German Wehrmacht campaigns into Russia, yeah. uh, there's one atrocity after another. Inhuman. <laughs> and they did the same thing to Poland. Sure did. <clears throat> so, uh, Rod Ely said it very well. He's reported to have said it one time. War is such a terrible thing. It's a good, it, it, good, it's a good thing war is so terrible. Else we would love it too much. Yeah. <laughs> so my closest friends are left, uh, that are left from 60 years ago mm -hmm. were those friendships I made during World War II. Yeah. I suppose when you're much younger and those experiences, unlike anything you would ever have had otherwise, mm -hmm. Stick with him. George was on George was on the punch bowl with his regiment, and we had a classmate that was on the also on the punch bowl. And so George wrote me he'd gone down to see Charlie. And so I wrote back and I said, Don't go down to see Charlie. That's too dangerous. And George said he'd laugh so when he got the letter because he said everything they did was dangerous. He said the most dangerous thing they did was go to the latrine. <laughs> <laughs> they kick the ball as they go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even going to try to make a funny on that one. <laughs> well, it was a punch bowl. That was in Korea up around the Chol on there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it was a punch bowl. Like that. My brother, my brother was going to Georgia Tech. He was a corporal in the Air Corps during World War II. And he, when he got to Georgia Tech, he decided to get a little extra money. So he signed up for ROTC. Guess who wound up in Korea as a forward observer with the artillery in 1951? <laughs> he, he did. Yeah. He told him, he said, I got a chemical engineering degree. He said, yeah, you also a field artillery officer. Goodbye. <laughs> Well, I had three brothers in the Korean War. But one brother was a graduate of West Point, class of 49. Mm -hmm. Another graduated from North Georgia College in 1950. He was a distinguished military student. He got a regular commission. They shipped the two of them to Germany, 1st Division. And they were up uh, in, on the line there, really, uh, right up against the Iron Curtain. Mm -hmm. So the two reserve officers, myself and the brother I mentioned, went to Korea. Mm -hmm. So when we got together, usually there was a little criticism of you guys in the regular army they don't like to fight, and that usually led to some fights. <laughs> started some fights, didn't it? <laughs> it really did. <laughs> one, one interesting thing during the, the war, George, one, one rainy night, they, this, this uh, accident reported to the 65th Division, and this officer came up and he, he reported to George and said, said that his was, name was Snelling. And George said, where are you from? And he said he was from Athens. And George said, are you yard dog? And he, and he almost dropped it. <laughs> he said he, he just couldn't believe it. The Travis at the university knew him. <laughs> <laughs> that, was a, that was a nickname. Yeah. That was, that was a chancellor Snelling over there. Yeah, that's right. He was his son. Probably. He was his son. And everybody called him Yard Dog. That was his nickname. But, to, but in the middle of the night in Germany, to ask, some, ask him if he's Yard Dog, that would really surprise him. I've been to New Delhi, India one time, and I suppose if we went. Either way from Atlanta, it's just about equal distance whichever way you go. It's about as far away from home as you can get. And when I got off the plane, there was a fellow from Livonia, Georgia down there, a young captain. I've forgotten his name. He's Ernie Vanderbilt's cousin. At any rate, we had a, we played Who Do You Know? My home was Tacoa, which is about 15 miles away. It's interesting how in old days we ran into old friends in far yeah. places. That's right. 
Well, do you ever get back to West Point to some of your reunions? Or I'd have, but now I'm not able to do it. I, my health won't permit me to get too far away. We went to all of them until, until we couldn't go anymore. Well, I'm about the only nine members of my class at West Point alive. Is Bob Scott still alive? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I see him every time I go down to Warner Robins. You do? I tell you. When you do, tell him that Pop Duncan said his best. Pop Duncan. Yeah. I'll do it. That's a remarkable museum that he's primarily responsible for it. I I haven't seen it. I understand that it is. I've never seen it. It's, uh... As a matter of fact, they have a display of all his books. He's written 21 books. He has written that many? Yeah. I just remember God is my co-pilot. <laughs> <laughs> well, I flew B-24 bombers during World War II, and uh, we had one out at Peach Street Camp several years ago. It's about the only one left flying. Mm -hmm. So a friend of uh, General Scott flew him up here so he could be co-pilot on his B-24 bomber and fly back to Macon, I think. And, uh, you know, there's always a wiseacre pilot around somewhere. And the uh, pilot of the airplane turned to me. Of course, General Scott was out there, and they were interviewing him and had the TV station, et cetera. And he was doing, he, was, he, does, he does a pretty good show. I think he's 95, he told me. That yeah. was on. Anyway, this pilot says to me, first time I ever had God for a co-pilot. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say one thing for Bob Scott. I saw him briefly. He came to Warner Roberts, where I was based, many years ago when he was director of uh, information for the Air Force. Mm -hmm. He had on the most beautifully tailored summer uniform with all that raw ribbons. One of the handsomest men I ever saw in uniform. Mm -hmm. He was remarkable. Well, I knew him. I saw him. Uh, I've seen him since he retired, and I retired. Yeah, he comes up to the West Point dinners. They have a they celebrate Founders Day every March, and uh, and he comes up for the dinners. I'll tell you, I worked for General Oscar Center, who was class thirty-three. I knew him. His wife's name was Ruth, lovely lady, and anyhow. Uh, he would get invited to the West Point down in Cincinnati. That was always a big occasion. Gar Davidson, the football coach, in his day usually was a gift of honor. And uh, he would say, Captain, would you kindly check the guest list and see who's the senior member of the class of 33? Well, I knew the answer because he always was. But, uh, uh, General Bozo McKee and uh, uh, Gar Davidson. I didn't get to go. I, was, I went to the University of Georgia, but uh, General Sutter said to me one time, he said, I think I'll make you an ex officio member of the class of 33. Mm -hmm. I said, General, does that mean I can have an assistant to keep all these records you want? <laughs> <laughs> he was a remarkable man. I have seen him for years. I understand he's from South Florida. He's a friend of hers. Yeah. Well, it's been most interesting, General. I have uh, a little bit of all the different decorations that you have received, a couple of silver stars. Those yeah. don't come easily. Well, I don't even know the occasion. I can't remember. I, I don't remember much anyway. No. They shot at you and missed. That's what yeah. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, I, I tell you, I think the American soldier is probably the best soldier we, uh, we've had. I mean, I mean, in the world. I mean, in the world. Uh, they, they had to face more and endure more hardships because we had first place we were engaged all over the world and uh, we had to fight in, in two hemispheres and, 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 and we, we won we won when we were engaged all over the world uh, and we didn't have anything except equipment but equipment and brave men <laughs> and innovative soldiers yeah 
We've still got four more minutes. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned this because I was with my group commander from World War II and I made an unfortunate comment. I said, uh, General, uh, it seems to me the youngsters today couldn't do the things we did when we were 19, 20 years old. And you know, he said, Chandler, these kids nowadays are so much smarter and so much better qualified than you were when I had you in my command. He said, you don't have anything to worry about. <laughs> well, that's true. This guy's uh, a smart. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and I didn't have any problem with uh, the soldiers doing a poor job. It was, they, they might not have seen me, but somebody along the line weeded them out before they ever got to me. I found them. I, I, I didn't find any soldiers that couldn't do the job or wouldn't do it. And uh, I was proud of them. Glad I had them in my command. My, uh, my commander in World War II was General Jimmy Doolittle. And I hasten to tell you, I knew him about as well as the uh, second lieutenant, the old three-star mm -hmm. general. But uh, <clears throat> he was such a famous aviator, mm -hmm. such a brave and talented and accomplished man. Uh, when he took over the 8th Air Force, the whole atmosphere changed. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, had, uh, we had some marvelous leaders. Uh, one of whom from Georgia was General Hunter from Savannah. He ran fighter command. <laughs> One of my favorite uh, Eighth Air Force members is uh, Major General Haywood M. Possum Hansel, who's graduate of Georgia Tech. Yeah. I think he was part of the probably the smartest Air Corps officer in World War II. He mm -hmm. did the original plan for the air offensive over Europe. Mm -hmm. Redid it at General Harrell's request a second time and was a major plan of the combined bomber offensive, commanded the B-29s in the Pacific, yet he's not very well known. Yeah, he's a marvelous right. job. <laughs> I had the great pleasure of meeting him one time. He must have been 81 or 2 at the time. He stood on a platform for the better part of an hour and told us how he and three other officers, a lieutenant colonel and two majors, he had done the time of the major, planned in 11 days the air offensive over Europe. Mm -hmm. And I got a copy of it, and you know what? They just about got it right. <laughs> and this was six months before Pearl Harbor. Yeah. <laughs> well, General Duncan, I think we've come to the end of the line here. I want to. Thank you and Mrs. Duncan for your time and for your reminiscence. It's really a, a, a pleasure for me and a great honor to be your interviewer. So I'm going to push the red button. I'm just going to turn it off in here. Yeah, that red light's going. Well, let me see. Come in here, Francis. <laughs> Francis keeps me honest. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's really a very pleasant. Hi, what's happening? Well, we it's got it. I'll push the red button and it won't turn off. Oh, it won't turn on. So we're ready to turn it on? Yeah. Don't turn oh. it off. Oh, we want to turn it off. 